What's going on everybody? It's Q from Retro Q Gaming here back with episode 4 of the Quack Experimental Podcast and we got a decent amount of stuff to talk about today. A lot of it looks much bigger than it is because the way I laid it out is, ooh this list looks huge. But I think a lot of it is kind of overblown and stuff I've talked about already so I'm just going to touch on that ever so slightly. So first off we'll get started with the PlayStation 5. Now Mark Cerny came out and gave a couple of details. He did confirm that there was a next generation console in development at Sony, and obviously that's going to be the PS5. Now, they went over some brief details. I went into a much more in-depth and in-detail video on it, I suppose you could call it, a little while back earlier this week. But today in this one, I just want to kind of touch on it very briefly. So they have said that it's going to use an AMD Ryzen based CPU, which will be an eight core and it's based on the seven nanometer new Zen 2 technology, which is their third generation Ryzen. Now, that's good to an extent because it has the potential to be really, really good. But even if it's a basic low end Ryzen, because it is going to be a custom one, but no matter what, even if it's slow and has problems and all that stuff, like console hardware typically does, because of you know all sorts of limitations with price, with heating, with cooling, with power draw, etc. But because of all of that, the promising side of it is that because it's using modern Ryzen-based architecture and it's just not a Jaguar core basically, that the fundamental game designs we'll see going forward, even if this chip is kind of underpowered and on the low end, is going to be hugely different and much, much more modern, unlike stuff that's had to be shoehorned onto the Jaguar CPUs of the PS4, PS4 Pro, Xbox One, Xbox One S, and Xbox One X over these last few years. Well, it lasts too many years at this point. But anyway, it's also going to be using a custom GPU, which is a custom variant of the Radeon Navi family, which will support some basic ray tracing, most likely. Navi family isn't out yet for the AMD GPUs just yet. It's going to be probably launching or probably at least announced at E3 in this year in the PC Gamer Show. Now, what does this mean? Because it's using the Navi one, does this automatically mean it's going to be a 4K 60fps max settings GPU? Absolutely not. Look at anything, anytime any company comes out with new GPUs, be it NVIDIA, be it AMD, whoever it is, when they come out with them, even if it's new architecture, they can have cheap entry-level budget ones that give budget performance. Sony have specifically thrown around 8K, which is laughable. They've also who knows what they're aiming for who knows if they're properly aiming for 1080 60 4k 30 4k 60 with the lowest quality settings who knows we'll have to find out and see because as it stands just basing it on radion's navi while this does have potential to go forward and go go decently well we do have to remember that there are entry level models in there too perfect example is when you look at AM, uh, not AMD, when you look at NVIDIA's new technology, the stuff that's using on the, the ray tracing, the RTX 2070, 2080 and 20 Ti, that's all based on the Turing architecture. So automatically you might assume, oh, anything with a Turing based architecture is, is beast mode, it's godlike. No, they've also released the GTX 1660, which uses the same Turing based architecture. It's basically crap. By comparison, it's you're you're using the new one. It's it's extreme entry level. You're getting performance from the pre, from the entry level of the previous gen or in around the mid midway of the previous gen. So it's just because it's the new architecture, it's nothing to go crazy about. But the potential is there. We'll have to see. Like I said, Sony's throwing in 8K. Who knows what they're what they're actually aiming for? 1080, 60, 4K, 30, 4K, 60, whatever. We'll have to wait and see. Console is probably about a year off, year and a half off. So we're not going to know just yet. Uh, the, because of the AMD chip, it's going to be using some type of 3D audio. 3D audio is... It's like a, a cut-down version of Dolby Atomos. Think of it as the free license Dolby, uh, Dolby Atomos because, well, they don't want to exactly pay for all that recording and they don't want to go to the hassle of it and pay the licensing fees and all as well. Now, 3D recording is good in... Or 3D audio is good in that sense because depending on your setup and what you're using... It may allow you to get a more, let's call it accurately, or more immersive audio side of it. I, I feel a lot of people will skimp on audio. People will go out, they'll buy a beast mode PC, they'll buy a beast mode monitor, and they'll use a shitty pair of headphones or a shitty pair of PC speakers. It's the same with home theater stuff. People will go out, they'll they'll spend four and a half grand on a TV, and then they'll buy a 150 euro 
crappy surround sound system. The I can't stress it enough that the audio side of an experience, especially one that you're going to be using so much over so such a long period of time, is it's integral. Don't skimp out. I implore you. I've said this again before with PC uh, PC monitors. People will completely build an entire new rig, an entire new everything, and then stick it on a you know they'll they'll buy a, an RTX twenty eighty PC and put it on an old school ten eighty sixty monitor. Upgrade your audio. Upgrade your visuals. Upgrade your everything, but just treat it equally or treat it similarly. Just anyway, <laughs> a bit off topic, bit off track. Yeah, they're going to support VR with the PS5, of course. They have said that the PS4 VR headset will work going forward. It's unknown if we'll get better frame rates, resolutions, or patches for better textures or better quality or anything in there too. I'm sure they will probably have uh, their own next-gen VR headset later in the, in the life cycle, or at least at some point in the life cycle, but it will probably be announced much later from what we have now. Because Mark Cerny said that they're not really wanting to talk about VR just yet, but he would confirm that it will work on, on the new one. Will it work with new games? Who knows? Will it work with PS5 VR games? We don't know, but we do know that it is PS4 backwards compatible, so it will work with your PS4 VR games, and of course, because it's PS4 backwards compatible, you can play all your games. Hopefully disc-based games without downloading a digital copy like the Xbox One does. I realize it's not a huge fault, it's not a huge problem, because at the end of the day, you're still getting it. But it would just be a little bit easier. Uh, PS4 games are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 gigabytes. You put the disc in, if it can install the majority of them from the disc, you're fine. However, when you look at it on the Xbox One, it's not too much of an issue because if you put in a 360 game, those games are five, six, seven, eight gigabytes for the most part. I realize that there's one or two that are multi-disc with maybe 20 gig, but PS4 games are considerably bigger. So hopefully that's sorted. Who knows if, we, if it's gonna be programmed to take advantage of the extra power in there too, like the Xbox One X is, or hell, just the Xbox One in general, where your games will, they'll take advantage of the power automatically you'll get better frame rates more stable frame rates if it's dynamic resolution or something it'll run at a, a natively higher one because it can use the power hopefully the ps5 is like that when it comes to ps4 backwards compatibility because performance this gen has been an absolute fucking joke um that's really it the, the only last thing to say is that uh, it's going to be supporting an, an ssd there will be a solid state drive in the ps5 which is phenomenal use i can't wait to see that because the example they gave was he booted up Spider-Man and did a quick fast travel in there too. On the PS4 with a regular mechanical hard drive, it did an 18 second fast travel loading time. With an SSD on the PS5 dev kit when he did the same thing, it did it in 0.8 seconds. This is something that PC gamers like myself are completely accustomed to. We know these blazing fast loading times, less than a second loading times are... Loading times on, on good PCs are literally one fraction. They're extremely small compared to what you console guys know. Especially with some games this gen. I mean, there's console games out there that take one, two, three minutes of loading time. I can do that in 20 seconds. I can do that in five seconds. I can do that in two seconds. It all depends on the individual case and what I'm loading. But it's nothing new and I can't wait for other people to be able to experience that and see all that too. Having said all that... I will say be careful with all these these specs and this info. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of places out there who are going to automatically hype this up way beyond what it's actually capable of. This could be a problem because we've seen this going into our current generation and it's probably going to be another one next gen because everyone wants to build up the hype, everyone wants to get the clicks, the views, the whatever it is. You be careful. Just because it's Ryzen, just because it's Navi, doesn't mean it's 8K, 120 FPS max settings by default. There's still many problems that could come up. Hopefully they don't. Hopefully we get good performance and good visuals at the same time. But we'll see how it goes. It's not going to be due out until, well, tipped to be late next year. So we'll, we'll see. We'll find out lots more information in the meantime. But sticking with the PlayStation stuff just for a second, we have The Last of Us 2, or The Last of Us Part 2. Now, this isn't a huge announcement. This is more speculation as well as a possible leak and possible rumor, whatever it is. But two things have happened when it comes to The Last of Us Part 2. Number one is that the final scene of the game... Well, it, they say the final scene. So 
it's unclear in the sense that is it the final scene that they shot? Did they shoot it out of order and now they've finally completed and shot the last scene? Or have they fi- did they do it in chronological order and finally shot the ending scene? So either way, they have finished shooting, they've finished doing the mocap, they've finished acting out all the scenes, all the voice work, all that stuff is all finished and completed for The Last of Us Part 2. Now it's just whatever, optimization, it's just art, it's it's touching up everything, it's making sure everything works, it's the programming, the coding and all as well. So that's all been completed on The Last of Us Part 2. Now, a lot of people are taking this as the game is going to be out this year, which is entirely possible. It could be Sony's big game for this year. As far as we know, we they don't have one yet. And they're fairly quiet on this front so far for what we know date-wise for big PS4 games this year. But when you look at The Last of Us Part 1, or The Last of Us 1, just The Last of Us, when they finished shooting the final scene in that one, six months later, the game launched. Now, there's a couple of websites out there that have theorized uh, through leaks or insider info, whatever they want to call it, that it's going to be out in March, uh, it's not March, in, um, in October of this year. Now, if you look at when... The Last of Us Part 2 has finished shooting, add six months to it, you get October. It is entirely possible. Of course, it's entirely not possible at the same time, so we'll have to wait and see. However, there is one little extra bit of info that says it might actually be out this year. A few weeks ago, or not even a few weeks ago, a few days ago, I should say, earlier this week, that's how I got my stuff mixed up, when you're looking at the the PSN upcoming games and all that stuff too, usually you'd go into upcoming games and all that as well. And you'd have games that were confirmed to not come out for two years. You'd have a game that's out next week. You'd have a game that's out somewhere in between, maybe next year or six months or eight months down the line or whatever. But you would have a huge range of games that were in this massive block. There was no date. They could be out tomorrow. They could be out next week, a month, six months, two years, whatever. But recently... Last of Us Part 2 was moved out of that section ever so briefly, and it was moved into the 2019 game section. So that does lend credence that it might actually be out this year. Now, we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully they fix up a state of play because that shit was awful, and they actually do some proper stuff with it. Give us some details, give us some whatever. Sony don't have too many huge press conferences or anything this year they've already cancelled e3 they didn't do a playstation experience last year there'll be other stuff like gamescom and and all that so hopefully we do see a little bit especially because they don't have too much in the middle of the year a lot of them will be towards the end and you don't want to really be saving a big announcement to say like let's say it's september comes around and whatever happens in september there's a convention say oh yeah this game is out next month that's a bit much. That's a bit much. Oh, and I don't care what anyone says. Days Gone is not a top tier Sony game, not at all. Now I'm I'm looking forward to the Last of Us Part Two. I can't wait for it. I like the first one a lot, and I'm hoping the second one turns out to be brilliant. It's going to be rough. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be rough because Part Two will likely be locked at 30 FPS. Uh, when I got my 4K monitor, I went back and I tried the Last of Us in native 4K 30 FPS, and it is rough going back. So, that might be a problem. Anyway, we'll see. That's that's for the future. After that is Capcom Home Arcade. Now, I'm only going to briefly touch upon this because I did make a video on it during the week as well. But Capcom are bringing in this Home Arcade system. It's a huge-ass joystick. It's actually a two-player arcade joystick. So, it's got all the buttons and all. It's got two sticks all built into it, one big unit. It has Wi-Fi, so it can go online and compare leaderboards and all as well. It's powered via micro USB, and it's got a HDMI out to your TV. Now, it comes with 16 games installed on it. You have 1944 Loopmaster, Alien vs predator armored warriors capcom sports club captain commando cyberbots full metal madness dark stalkers the night warriors eco fighters final fight i well i can't even type properly I couldn't spell final fight ghouls and ghosts giga wing mega man the power battle pro gear street fighter 2 hyper fighting the best version of street fighter mind you Strider, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. Now, that's all well and good. Most of that is just quality arcade games that many people will be happy about. One thing I will say is it's very important to note that Alien vs. Predator is on there because that is a licensed game. So they would have had to go to what is now Disney because Fox used to own the Alien and Predator license. And Disney bought them out. Disney acquired the license. So they had to go in that. But the point is Capcom were willing to go to them about it. Disney were willing to license it out, so that's important. I talked about this in two different videos this week. One was the Capcom one, and one was the 
the, the future of lice, of old school lost license games, as I like to call them. So there is promise in that too. It is a bit expensive because, well, between all of this stuff as well, the whole mini console trend, and the fact that it uses, well, I have it here, Sanwa JLF TP 8Y, is that 8 or B? 8Y sticks, 8Y T sticks and OBSF buttons, the fact that it uses actual arcade buttons and arcade hardware in that regard, and it's coming out on the 25th of October 2019, it's 230 euro though, the price is there, the price is up there, it's a bit high, I've reached out to Capcom, hopefully they send me a, a, a review unit, at the same time, I have ordered one, I'm not gonna lie, I have ordered one, if Capcom do decide to send me a review unit, which they probably won't, I will cancel my one and let them send me the review one. If you want to contribute to the cause, I would say head on over to Twitter. Let Capcom know. It's like, oh yeah, I'd love to see him read. I've tweeted them about it myself. Like the tweet, you know, retweet the tweet. Feel free to throw it in there as well and just say, you know, well, uh, yeah, this, this this guy knows what he's talking about. He likes beat em ups. He likes arcade games. I'd love to see Capcom. You know, you know, uh, why not get that done? Anyway, who knows? Maybe I'll cancel it anyway. I, probably won't but there is a little bit of question at the moment i haven't looked too too big into it at, uh, in detail there's a lot of questions about the emulation they're using and uh, there's something called final burn alpha which is a different variant on the arcade final burn emulator but there's some licensing issues and some what do they call it uh, not a, I, I guess it's terms of service that are potentially going to cause problems or potentially have problems Apparently, they've they've talked to the guys in charge, or one of the guy, the head guy in charge, and he has said, yeah, it's properly licensed, this, that, and the other. But at the same time, if you dig really in-depth and in detail into the whole situation, it uses code uh, from other stuff that cannot be sold for commercial purposes. Even if you if you agree to use that code, you cannot use it. It's, it's, very, it's very strange. We're going to have to wait and see what happens over the next... I'd say a couple of months because it's not out till October, but something like this will probably be rectified fairly soon if there is an issue because they need everything. They need their ducks in a row a long time in advance for products for legal reasons. We'll see how it goes anyway. Like I said, I have one on order. Hopefully Capcom decide to send me one instead. But yeah, it is what it is, you know. After that, we have the Xbox One backwards compatibility. Now, it's been a good week for a lot of people out there for Xbox One backwards compatibility because Microsoft added not only new games to backwards compatibility, some of the new games will be Xbox One X enhanced. And there's also Xbox One X enhancements coming for existing games as well. Ninja Gaiden 2 is going to be Xbox One X enhanced. That's adding to backwards compatibility it's it's on by now but it also has xbox one x enhanced features fable 2 and fable 3 which are already backwards compatible are being enhanced for xbox one x splinter cell conviction splinter cell blacklist and double agent which are already backwards compatible are being enhanced for xbox one x now all these patches are probably out by now i don't know if they're ready to go live pretty much as they're announced i would assume so but they're all there anyway, so there is promise in there too. A lot of people are asking for Ninja Gaiden 2. I'm not a huge fan myself, but uh, I know a lot of people wanted it. Now, many of the, the stuff for these, the, the backwards compatibility Xbox One X enhancements, they just make it look nicer. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to run a game from instead of 540p or 720p up at native 4K. It does help a bit. The big problem is a lot of these backwards compatibility games have very low texture quality, very low asset quality, because they're 360 games, and they don't give any new stuff for that. So you're still, okay, granted, you're playing it at native 4K, the, the improved native real resolution does help, but you're using very low quality text. Now, I use backwards compatibility a lot, so, well, I, I used to when I turned my Xbox on, but, you know, I'm not going to shit on it that way. It's just, I mean, you can, still, you can get the PC versions for, like, €4 Euro at, at this point, and... These games aren't hard to run. Now, having said that, you know, having said that, Spider Cell Double Agent is a fantastic game. I have Blacklist. I have no interest in whatsoever. And Conviction killed the series for me. Double Agent is a great game, as is the original trilogy. Hopefully, they bring the original trilogy to backwards compatibility. If they already haven't, I don't know. I don't think they have. Sticking with Xbox stuff for the moment, though, we have a little bit of news on the Halo TV series. Now, Halo in its expanded universe has been a mess for the longest time between, we call them like live action 
small series, live action YouTube series, whatever, uh, films being cancelled or passed around and all this shit. But apparently this one is actually working now. There's, there's, there's progress being made, as small as it is, because they've announced that there will, they've, they've confirmed an actor who will play Master Chief in the Halo TV series. Now, it's going to have its own story and all as well. It's going to have other characters, new characters that help set up other different different parts of the story. They're going to fill in blanks in the Chief's history. We'll see how that goes. But the big important thing is someone named Pablo Schreiber, who I have no idea who he is, is going to be playing, jo well, I suppose you call him John, you know, Spartan 117, Sierra 117, whatever you want to call him. So that's possibly promising. I don't know. I don't know him as an actor. Maybe I should look him up, actually, but we'll see how it goes. Other than that, we'll stick with Halo stuff for a moment, and we're talking about the Master Chief Collection. We're talking about Master Chief Collection on PC, specifically. Now, what happens is, we all know, that, I'll give you a brief version of it. Master Chief Collection is coming to PC, we all know, Windows 10 Store, as well as Steam. They're going to be releasing the games chronologically, like individual in chronological order, lore-based chronological order. So it's Halo Reach, Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3, ODST, Halo 4. So that's all good. Now, what was, what was going to happen was they were hoping to have Halo Reach testing, or as they call it, flighting, in April. They were hoping to get it flighted on Xbox first, my Xbox is over there, I'm pointing to it. My, they were hoping to do it on Xbox first, and then maybe within a couple of weeks later, they could flight the PC version. Now, 343 Industries have already said that they want to hang off with the PC version. They want to take a little bit longer with it, because PC is a different beast. Developing for that is much more complex than small, static, underpowered hardware, like, say, the Xbox One consoles. So there's a lot to do in that regard. And unfortunately, they said that the testing, the flighting for the PC version of Halo Reach, since that's the first one going to be released, might actually be delayed beyond April. Now, it's not confirmed to be delayed just yet. They're being optimistic about it. They want to say it will still come in April, but they're not confirming it's definitely still in April, and they're not confirming that it's pushed. They're just saying that it is a very real possibility that it might not happen in April, which to me just sounds like they're kind of saving face in the fact that it's probably going to be delayed outside of April to like some point in May. I'm kind of okay with that. I want to see them get it done right, especially because it's Halo. I want it on PC again. It's going to be so good. And Halo Reach is, is going to be added and remastered as well, which I'm so happy about. It, it's going to be very hard for me to not do it on Xbox One X, because that one will come first. But I kind of want to wait and redo the entire collection, the Master Chief collection on PC because it's going to be great. I'm, I'm going back hard with Halo. I'm probably going to stream them all again. I've already streamed the entirety of the Master Chief Collection from an old school Xbox One back in the day. Not even an enhanced Xbox One X version, but naturally streaming it on PC would be a whole other beast. Mouse and keyboard support, 120 FPS, 1440p, buttery smooth, max settings. Mm, feels good, man. Glorious PC Gaming Master Race for life. We'll see how it goes. We'll have to wait on more info to find out if it's delayed out or, or whatever it's not. And Well, we'll have to wait and see. So we'll move away from Halo for a second and some more GameStop news of all things. You might remember last week I talked about GameStop when they were having issues with their the, the money they've lost, basically. They're coming up with all types of new plans and all to try to get people into the store, incentives to buy pre-owned stuff, and st incentives to trade more stuff in so they can sell pre-owned stuff at higher markups. So... They're trying a new one as well now. This is only trialing in certain US stores. This is also not 100% confirmed. It was sent in to many, many places by GameStop staff. There was various pictures and emails and stuff as well. We don't know how fully accurate and fully legit it is, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So GameStop are doing something that they're calling a guaranteed to love it program. So what that means is it's, they're going to be trialing it on select brand new games. You can essentially buy a game. Now, there are a couple of caveats and terms and conditions to this. You can buy a game brand new. You can bring it home and play it. If you don't like it, you can return it to the store within 48 hours. As long as everything is in perfect condition, it can obviously be open and played. But as long as the game, the box, the manuals, the paperwork, if there is even manuals or paperwork, are in perfect condition and undamaged and can be resold, 
you can essentially get your money back. Now, like I said, a couple of caveats for that. One, when you get your money back, you get it in credit only form. You get it in store credit. This game or this policy is only available on certain games, at least they're trying it. So it's not like you can buy a game, bring it back two days later, get a different game two days later, get a different game two days later. It's only on specific games. Supposedly, they're going to be launching this program with Days Gone, which is out at the end of the month. If it takes off, they might continue it on other select games going forward and then possibly expand it beyond that to maybe all new games or new games released in the last couple of months or full price games or whatever. Obviously, the money back thing, the credit back, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, if you still keep returning and keep the credit, buy something else, they still get your money. So at the end of it, they're still making out as a profit because they're not losing any stock in that regard for the new side of it. And if you're buying like pre-owned stuff, it you know even if you buy two two thirty thirty dollar games pre-owned each, which are sixty dollars credit, they would have only paid like ten dollars each for those games. So they're still making forty euro off you, and at the same time, they still have their copy of Days Gone. So it's it's not a terrible idea. It's definitely a consumer friendly idea. I know when I a couple of years ago when I bought, well, what was it called? Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. I brought that game home and I played it. And I actually called GameStop later that day because, oh my god, it was just awful. And uh, No, it wasn't GameStop. Where did I buy that? I can't remember. Wherever I bought it anyway, I called them later that day. I'm just so used to saying GameStop because, you know, it's, it's GameStop. But I remember calling the place and I said, listen, is, do you have guys have a return policy? And I was like, yeah, does it not work or what's the deal? I was like, listen, it's, it's just, honestly, it's the worst game I've ever played. And she just said, you know, we, we can't take it back for change of mind or anything like that. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. It's... So it is consumer friendly in that regard. I know really, I realize you're still not 100% getting your money back, but it beats the problem if you do buy a select new game and you don't like it. So you're not stuck with it. You don't have to trade it in two days later for half the price. So you're still making out a, a little bit in in that regard. Oh, and it also it only applies to new versions, uh, it's new standard edition versions of up to $60. And from what I understand, because it works differently in the US, it doesn't refund your tax. So if the game is $60 plus tax, which I don't know how much, I don't know if that would work out at like $66, $70, $75. But let's just say for argument's sake, it's $6. Let's say it's a $60 game with $6 tax. They will give you 60 credit. They won't give you 66 credit. It's just the, the price of the game, essentially. They'll give you that back. So, and like if you buy a big collector's edition of a game, they're not going to give you 120, 150, 200 dollars back or whatever it is. So, I mean, the, the promise is there. They can build on it. We'll see how it goes if they're even still around in a few years for it to happen. But anyway, we've uh, we've got a, an interesting one that came out of nowhere next. There's a game out there called Thirteen. It's based off an old. I don't remember the country in Europe it's from. It's based off some old kind of cult comic, and there's even a live action TV show of it at one point. Like I said, it's called Thirteen. It's originally a PS2, OG Xbox, and GameCube game. And it's being remade for all modern platforms. PC, Switch, Xbox One, PS4. It's being remade on. It's an Ubisoft game. It's completely cell shaded And it's a first person shooter. I remember it being good. I have a copy of it upstairs. I think it's on a PS2. Not the original one I played. I think I played that on the OG Xbox. Maybe the GameCube. But I don't remember. That's kind of irrelevant. But they, um, they're they remaking it out of nowhere to everyone's surprise. So it's, it's I remember it being a really long game. It has like 30 or 40 levels. From, from what I remember, at least, anyway. It's promising. Uh, unfortunately, it is an Ubisoft game, so I cannot buy it, and I cannot support that company. But there's many people out there who really like it, and will buy it, and will play it, and all that, too. We'll see how it goes. It's kind of funny, because at the same time, the main character is voiced by David Duchovny. I don't know if they're going to be redoing all the lines, or if they're going to be just reusing the, the existing voice work, or maybe they'll just get someone else to do it completely, because they don't want to pay David Duchovny or licensing fees. Who knows? Who knows? All I do know is that when I played 13 back in the day, it gave birth to some of my most epic puns and my most epic quotes. To this point where the game is about 15, 16, 17 years old. And to this day, myself and my friends, we still bring up some of the quotes I, I had from that game. Some of the puns and the plays on words that I had in, in that game back in the day. They still come up on the reg. So, 
good times. Good times. What have we got next? Uh, next up is, oh, the Mega Drive Mini. Now, we all know Sega are releasing the Mega Drive Mini, and it's going to have 40 built-in preloaded games. Now, they've already listed off the first 10 preloaded games before. They're doing this to, as kind of a tease to keep the hype going. They don't want to just announce them all at once, let it go silent for six months, and then release it. They're going to announce batches of 10 every so often. So they've, they've already announced the first one, the first 10. Now the second batch has come out. Now, they've announced the Japanese batch, which I'm not going to talk about here because it doesn't really affect probably yourselves or me. But they have announced the European and American second batch as well. So the games number 11 through 20 are Earthworm Jim, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse, World of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, where, where am I? Oh, Contra Hard Corpse, Streets of Rage 2, Thunder Force 3, Super Fantasy Zone, Shinobi Tree, Return of the Ninja Master, and Landstalker. Now, this is some of these are very good games. Earthworm Jim is a great game. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is a great game. Cast of Illusion, World of Illusion, Contra, Streets of Rage 2. They're great games. Um, Shinobi Tree, not so much. They should have probably stuck with Revenge of Shinobi. But the big thing I want to talk about in this one is look at some of these games. Some of these are licensed games, just like I mentioned in the other video and earlier on in this podcast as well. We have... Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse and World of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. These are officially licensed games. These have to be hammered out in deals between Sega and between Disney. Sega is willing to go and do this. Disney is willing to sit down and talk and do this. That's very promising. It brings so much potential for these kind of games to actually happen and come back. Because a big issue I always had was lost licensed games. I've talked about it multiple times before. But now, it's promising. It looks like they are are coming back. Oh, this next one. This next. Oh, and by the way, the Mega Drive Mini is coming out in October. I have one pre-ordered. I can't wait to play it. And I will probably stream a lot of it. But next up, we have Mr. Mr. Colonial Marines. I mean, a lot of people dislike Randy Pitchford. With perfectly justifiable reasons. He's just an arsehole. He's just an absolute arsehole. No matter what he does, he just comes across as an arsehole. Everything he does, everything he says, how he acts, the way things happen, it's just damage control after arseholeness, after damage control after arseholeness. It's terrible. But anyway, Randy Pitchford is back at it again. He's been very vocal in his defense of the Epic Games Store and putting Borderlands 3 on the Epic Games Store, timed exclusive for six months before it comes to Steam in April of 2020. Now, Randy Pitchford, he's out there going on, uh, complaining about all these other all these other people, and everyone on Twitter, everyone on forums, everyone on YouTube, wherever it is. And he's he basically says, bitch and moan all you want. It's sticking to the Epic Game Store for six months. It's better for Borderlands to come to the Epic Game Store exclusively for six months. He specifically said it's better for Borderlands 3 to do that. Now do I think that's the case? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, I could be wrong. I could absolutely be wrong. But just to ignore the biggest, the, the biggest, what do we call it, player base in the world of any platform, because Steam is bigger than any console. Hell, Steam is bigger than all current consoles put together because of user base and all that too. So to ignore that, and then you look at the Epic Game Store, which is about one quarter, if not one fifth, of the player base of Steam, and you're saying your two, or well, you could argue three because of the pre-sequel, your three biggest games, your, your only three big games in the franchise actually, that are doing well and known for on the Steam platform, it's better to move it away to something else with a fraction of the player base, just because you get more money and you've received a massive payoff from the company. I mean, you can defend it all you want, some of us aren't stupid, Randy. I realize that some people out there still read Polygon, still believe Kotaku, but the rest of us aren't stupid. We know. We we don't care. You can defend it all you want. You're just you're just wrong, basically. And it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting because what I would kill to see, which is something we'll probably never see and no clar- clarification that we'll ever receive, is that in situations like this, I would love to see. Let's use Metro and Borderlands, for example. 
I would love to see, and we'll use the Outer Worlds because that's coming soon. I would love to see their initial launch sales on the Epic Store. And I would love to see their initial launch sales on Steam. I would love to see it. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still, to be honest, I will be completely honest about this because, well, I mean, you. I, I could easily hide this, but I won't because I'm, I'm that kind of dude. Usually I would be 100% against supporting Epic because I've talked about it multiple times in the past. I'm just 100, usually 100% against supporting them until they get their, their product, which is their store, up to uh, a level which I deemed worthy of my monetary support. However... I'm going to freely admit, especially because of I've been playing Borderlands lately, I'm 50-50 about Borderlands. I'm 50-50 about buying Borderlands 3 on the Epic Game Store. I want it so much and so badly that I don't know. I don't know if I can do it or not. I don't know if I can wait that six months. And to be honest, that kills me inside. It kills me inside that I might actually have to support it and that I can't 100% commit to standing against it. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see how it goes anyway. But the thing that especially makes... There's one final point I want to talk about when it comes to Randy Pitchford here. There's one especially salty thing he wants to say about this. He says Steam is going to be... Because it, you know it's great to launch on a Borderland, uh, Borderlands 3 on the Epic Games Store for six months, blah, blah, blah. First off, I think it's funny because they're the only game that doesn't have a one-year exclusivity. So clearly they're they're afraid of some capacity. They realize there's a difference and there's some problem there because it's only six months instead of one year. And I don't know about you guys, but Borderlands, out of every game that's Epic Game Store exclusive or timed exclusive, out of every game that launches on there, Borderlands 3 is the biggest hyped, the biggest anticipated, and it's probably the one with the biggest amount of sales. And yet, this company who claims that releasing on this platform is good for the game, it's good for the series, it's good for everyone, they're only they're the only company and the only game doing a six month half the length of every other timed exclusivity deal. Clearly, they are afraid of something. They're afraid of less sales. They're afraid of pissing people off. Whatever it is, they're clearly afraid of something. The evidence is right there. They can say all they want. They can complain about bitching and moaning all they want. They can say it's best for the Epic Game Store. They've got their cut. They've got their big money. They've got their their, their statement from from Epic Games, whatever it is. The proof is in the pudding. The evidence is right there for everyone, Randy. Deal with it. But the last thing I want to say about this, because I, did, I didn't even touch on it. Randy Pitchford has gone out and stupidly said, Steam is going to be a dead store in five to ten years. So it's great that they can get in on the Epic Games store from day one with Borderlands 3. Now, in theory, okay... I'm going to say this just for clarification purposes, because I know if I don't, someone will put it in the comment section below, blah, blah, blah. It is entirely possible that Steam could be a dead store in five to ten years. Is it plausible? I mean, hell, it's it's entirely possible that almost anything could happen. But is it plausible that Steam will be a dead store in five to ten years? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Steam have already tried to do a few things to combat this. Well, they've tried to do kind of one thing to combat this, really. One big important thing. And that is they've come up with a tiered well, a tiered cut system, if you will. A tiered split sharing, profit sharing system. Whereas if your game sells a certain amount, they they change your, your profit sharing. Where you the developer gets more, the more copies they sell. Now, that's a start to combat back against Epic. It's it's so Randy Pitchford for him to say that Steam would be a, a dead store in five to ten years because it's so him just to suit his narrative that Steam will do absolutely zero in ten year in the next ten years to try and not combat this because that would fit his narrative so he thinks that. And that way he can say, oh yeah, they're not going to do anything. If they don't do anything in 10 years, they'll be gone. What Do I honestly think Steam is just going to sit there and just let themselves die? Absolutely not. They're going to fight back. It's Valve. They take time to do this stuff. They've already started a little bit. We'll see how it goes going forward. But that's just so ignorant from Randy. And it's so Randy Pitchford that... It's like as much as I love Borderlands 2, it's one of the best first person shooters I've ever played, and it's just so well done in so many ways. As much as I love that, 
I hate Randy Pitchford for passion. He's just such a goon. Goon is the only word I could I could properly use for it. It's, I don't know. I just think it's it's so bad. It's so stupid. It's such idiocy. But we'll move on anyway. I've I've talked about Borderlands too too much at this, or well, I've talked about Randy Pitchford and his gimpness too much at this point. So next one is just a small one I want to touch on real quick, and it's to do with why I always say the whole online, own, always online, only online, digital future kind of thing is not really a great idea. And believe it or not, EA are finally closing the Burnout Paradise servers. Now, not the remastered one. The remastered one is fine. But this game came out in 2008. So this game is 11 years old. So the player base is understandably extremely small, if it even exists at all. So EA obviously have all the numbers, and they have said, okay, you know what? It's not viable for us to keep this open anymore. August 1st, 2019, we are shutting down all these servers. So anyone who plays Burnout Paradise on the 360 version, the PS3 version, or the original PC version, not the remaster, your servers are gone. You're, they're just being turned off and all as well. Now, that's completely understandable. I mean, it, is it, it's too much to ask. I'm not saying is it too much to ask. It is too much to ask for a company to keep servers open if it's not making them a profit or if there's no point to keeping them open. I mean, for all we know, no one has played on these servers in four years and they're finally cutting them off. But... 11 years f online servers for an EA game is fantastic because though there's been incidents in incidents in, in yeah incidents in the past or instances was the word I'm looking for where well, it's the same thing really but EA have shut down servers after like 12 months after 16 months after 18 months after two years so it does happen and in EA's case that's very very strange who knows maybe they forgot they had them up for 10 years like maybe maybe two years into the game's lifespan, they completely forgot the servers were up, and then one day they just stumbled upon it, and said, "Oh yeah, we better shut them off." But I mean, the the fact that the, this component, uh, the online component of games, is going off is disheartening. It's disheartening, and I mean, I realize it's it's unviable and it's unwieldy for them to keep that stuff up forever. But hey, had a good run. Now, uh, moving from Burnout Paradise, we'll go back to a little bit of hardware, specifically Xbox One hardware. It's something I talked about before as well, so I can just briefly touch on it here too. The Xbox One S All Digital Edition is uh, is official. It's completely announced. For some reason, they kept that name because it abbreviates as the Xbox One Sad Edition. That's right, Xbox One S All Digital Edition. Xbox One SAD, Xbox One Sad Edition. How do they not come up with this? They have people with all sorts of qualifications and degrees and stuff that can't see this. They have marketing people, business leads, projects, project managers, all this stuff. They have all of these people, these highly educated people with their book smarts who clearly have no street smarts because the guy who named the Xbox One has come out and said on record, not the, not the digital one, not this one, he's come out on record and said he was really upset and disappointed with himself that he never... When he was designing the name for the Xbox One, he never realized that it could be shortened to X-Bone because he didn't like X-Bone. That's kind of a slur, if you will. I don't know how you can slur a fucking piece of plastic. But the fanboys consider that a slur. And it's like a negative thing that they use. But he he couldn't see. When he looked at all the abbreviations and all the possibilities that you could do with Xbox One as a name, he didn't see X-Bone. And he was upset about that. And now someone, or probably multiple people who are paid too much money, sat in a boardroom, designed all this kind of stuff, and came up with an Xbox One sad edition. And probably didn't see it at all. I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's madness. Anyway, back onto the point on, on, on hand here. It comes with... It's official. It's, uh, it's completely legit. It's finally happening. It's launching on May 7th for €220. Euro. The, the price is important. We'll get to now in a second. It launches pre-installed with Minecraft, Forza Horizon 3, and Sea of Thieves. Now, it says these games are pre-installed as opposed to just, you know, download codes included. Who knows? Maybe they don't want you selling the codes or something. But it says that they're pre-installed. Maybe they are. And the price, I said, is €220. Euro. Now, that is important for several reasons. They have maintained that there's going to be a €50 Euro price differential between this and the standard Xbox One S. Now, obviously, the yeah, standard Xbox One S is going to be is going to be €50 Euro more expensive. 
usually could or could not come with a game depending on whatever most people are freaking out about this they're freaking out about the price like oh why is it more expensive this that and the other a lot of places don't take into consideration that these are manufactured retail prices or manufacturer suggested retail price or recommended retail price now there are places out there who are selling xbox ones xbox one s even with no games for more expensive than microsoft are recommending there's also places out there who are selling it for less than microsoft are recommending so places might be selling it for 250 euro and say oh well this is uh this one is 220 why would i buy this when i could buy uh, one terabyte Xbox One S with a disk drive and Gears of War 4 for, for 20 euro more, for 250 euro. It's based on the manufacturer retail price, what they suggest. Other places can sell it for more, other places can sell it for less, and other places can sell it for those prices. Now, they've said that it w if when the official prices change, like if the Xbox One S changes, if it goes down in price, the digital version will drop in price to keep it with a 50 euro price differential between them. So it's going, to it's going to kind of stick in there with that. Obviously, there's there's important stuff all over the box to say, hey, this does not come with a disk drive. So people know what they're buying and they don't want to be misled with it when, when it happens, basically. Now, we'll move away from Xbox One's sad edition. And we move on to something else that's pretty sad. That's clickbait. Absolute clickbait. We're going to talk a little bit about clickbait because there's two fairly high profile clickbait things going around this week one of them is, fa is fairly more significant the other one is just it's a bit smaller but it's still a clickbait now the first one we're going to go we're going to start with the smaller one okay halo infinite was reported to have a battle royale mode now it's going to be shipping with a battle royale mode or whatever it is now this came from wherever I've seen multiple different places, cite different people, cite different videos, cite different everything about it. So it's hard to say where it actually came from. Or, well, to be honest, it was probably just fake and made up. Like, I consider pretty much every leak out there to be. Because they all say, oh, insider source. Uh, it's a tip to be this. You follow it and it's just some dude with a random post on a forum somewhere. So, like, oh, this guy posted this on Reset Era. Who is he? I don't know. Really? That's your source? You're making a video on that? You're talking about this? Websites are running this? But anyway, it's beside the point. So it was tipped to launch or have at launch a Battle Royale mode. Now this was, this drew a lot of people's ire, myself included, because 343 Industries had previously said on record that they have no interest in launching a Battle Royale mode and that the only BR that they're interested in is the Battle Rifle. Nice pun. I'll give them that. But anyway, this kind of picked up traction a lot because when you think about it, the way I always look at this stuff is the team, the money, the manpower, the time they put into developing, let's say, a Battle Royale mode, they could have put into the regular multiplayer. They could have put into Firefight. They could have put into the story. You see what I mean? See why this can be a little bit of an issue. That's why I, I don't really like that too much, especially because they went back under Word. That also annoys me. But... Frank O'Connor, one of the heads of 343 Industries, and specifically the Halo brand, I think he's the, I think his official title is the Halo brand manager, Frank O'Connor, he came out and posted about it. It's like, this is absolutely false. This is completely false. It will or it won't launch with a Battle Royale mode. It won't have one at launch. We're not willing to talk about what is going to be there at launch, but Battle Royale is not going to be there. Technically, Battle Royale may come down the line, he says. They have no plans to do it, but they're obviously not saying no. And in theory, he says that players could use Forge, which is the map editor and game editor mode. You can kind of make one with that. You just have to change the rules and all with it too. And because obviously you can set the rules for the games and the, and the limits and all. So you could, in theory, create your own one using that. So who knows? Maybe we will eventually see a Halo Infinite Battle Royale. Hopefully we don't. I don't. I don't think we'll officially see one at least within the first couple of years or at least within we won't see it at launch anyway maybe it'll be post-launch stuff we don't know i just think it's funny that they came back and shut down uh like a, just such a bullshit rumor with no proper source none that i could find at least anyway now let's move on to the bigger and a little bit more serious <laughs> clickbait this is the kotaku clickbait oh q which one pretty much everything does is kotaku social justice warrior I don't know, uh, what's the social justice warrior virtue signaling clickbait piece. 
for an agenda. Yeah, you're pretty much accurate. But anyway, in this case, you have Kotaku UK and fake journalist who I don't know why anyone has ever taken seriously. I'll give a, an example of which now in a moment, Laura K. Dale. Now, she's loved by the Nintendo fan base because... <sighs> anyway, anyway. The reason why I think this is she's such a joke is places cite her as a legitimate source of information. Legitimate leaks, legitimate predictions, legitimate insider info, all of this stuff. Now, the funny thing about this, many people probably don't know this because they usually only go off the mainstream website stuff. So, I'll give you, I'll break it down for you. Laura Kate Dale has a significantly higher amount of predictions and insider info leaks and whatnot than the media pick up. Now I'm talking a significant amount, probably like 20 times more than you, the average viewer, would probably see. Because only maybe about 5% of those are picked up by websites because they're stuff they want to talk about. They're stuff that will drive clicks. Like, I don't know, if a Smash character is leaked or leaked, you know, they'll run with that versus if it's some no-name character in like Battle, was it Battle Ta SNK Heroines or something? They're not going to talk about that. How many people are going to click into that versus how many people are going to click into a Smash Bros. leak? You see my point. So she has about 20 times more leaks than most places report on. Now, so even though you have her normal leaks, the ones that you do report on, the amount of those that are accurate and actually come true are extremely small. Now, compare the ones that actually come true versus the ones that she properly tries to predict, not just the ones they pick up on. The credibility is like 2%. Her accuracy is about 2%. So I don't know why places will credit her as a proper source, as a, as it was well, not considerable, as a trustworthy source, as, a, as an accurate source. It, it's just an absolute joke to me. But anyway, that's beside the point. That's why I, I find it very hard to take her seriously. Also because it's Kotaku and, well, we all know they have a special agenda. But it gets better. It gets better. So, with the release of Joker from Persona 5, or possibly even just Persona Q2, because there's currently no version of Switch, or no version of Persona 5 on the Switch, there might be in a few weeks, but, or a few days. But anyway, the, with the addition of Joker and his stage and some of the music tracks and all as well, they decided that they would do no, have no journalistic integrity, no journalistic progress, no journalistic dignity, no research, no anything. Someone reported to them, a random person reported to them, that they heard the word retarded in a lyric in one of the songs. Now, as someone who loves Persona 5 so much, I can tell you, I have listened to multiple different versions of that song, because there are, I think there's like four different versions of it on the soundtrack alone, let alone other versions of it, because there's live versions, all that stuff. I have never once heard that lyric as retarded because that lyric or those lyrics because it's two words are retort it retort it r-e-t-o-r-t -E -T space i-t retort it now the singer who sings these she's oh she's not japanese she's from somewhere in asia she obviously has an accent because she's speaking in English as well, or she's singing in, in English. So she has a, a, an Asian country accent, singing in... Now, her English is very good, I will give her that, but she still has an accent. And instead of going and doing any type of due diligence, which is your fucking job as a journalist... Not just a games journalist, but as a journalist. Games journalists are, are the worst. They don't even proofread their shit anymore. It's terrible. They, they get these people literally get paid for their words and they can't even do that right but anyway they cannot instead of reaching out and waiting for a comment because yes they did say they reached out to nintendo and atlas but they just published it anyway they published this anyway so they published an article about it they, instead of they quickly listened to it themselves said oh yeah this is this sounds like retarded despite it clearly not being the official lyrics even say that it's not you can hear that it's not, at least, unless you want to hear that that's what it is. And they went and published a piece to say, oh, Persona 5 Music Smash Brothers uh, includes a disability slur. Naturally, 
many people out there very unhappy. Official, what do we call them? The, the, the voice actors. The voice actors who put their heart and soul into these games, who probably know a little bit about this too, as well as they have working ears. They even said the same thing and said, well, you know, maybe you could wait for comment back. Maybe you could listen to it yourselves. It's clearly not. Maybe you could ask someone about it. It's a mess. Now, they, they completely backtracked on this as well. Pers uh, not Persona. Kotaku completely backtracked all over this. It's an absolute mess, but they've gone back over it. So they left the article up. Put a small little footnote in there as well to say, oh, you know, uh, maybe we were wrong and maybe it doesn't include it. But then in the same fucking paragraph, they went out and said, but maybe it does. So imagine that. Imagine, imagine having an article, a, a potentially libelous and slanderous article, like a law, like liable by law. Defamate? No, it wouldn't be defamate. Be, you'd be liable and slander. Well, I guess you'd be liable for, for it, yeah rather than slander, but potentially libelous article. And then at the bottom, you say, oh, we were possibly wrong, but we're also possibly not wrong. Imagine saying that at the bottom. How idiotic is that? It's absolute madness. Now, there's been all sorts of shit that's come out over it over the next few days as well. You have people like Laura Kate Dale trying to defend herself, and she was told, allegedly told not to defend herself by her editor, and she was like throwing him under the bus and saying, oh no, I wanted to wait for, for Nintendo and, and Atlas, and I wanted to wait for other people, but they published it anyway without my consent. <sighs> this is not how this thing works. Not how this thing works. You can't work for Kotaku. Kotaku of all places, and try to play dumb doesn't work that way doesn't she's fired anyway she's no longer works for kotaku her job is probably pretty much done hopefully i hope nintendo or atlas or both or sega because they own atlas sue kotaku they could do with another uh, another lawsuit it's only been what two three years since hogan fucking body slammed them leg dropped them all over the place but yeah it's just it's so bad it's so and it, it annoys me so much because these people are paid far too much money for doing a, an extremely easy job extremely poorly it just it blows my mind it absolutely blows my mind now i will say this as well i have talked to several people from several different websites over the course of now it's not in relation to this but over the course of the last few years i've talked to several different people who work for several different websites even if they're small irish ones if they're bigger mainstream ones europe ones just kind of worldwide ones i've talked to them and even though they will try to damage control the stuff in-house they secretly like well what was told to me by people who work in journalistic careers is that even though this would look bad and drum up a lot of negative press and all for the website, it's still, they, they still love it because everyone is talking about that website. Everyone is clicking in to that website. All those ads are there. The traffic is there. The ads are there. It looks really good on a numbers game that they, a numbers page, a numbers spreadsheet, whatever, that they can show to their investors, their bosses and all at the end. Sure, it might look bad short term. They might have to do some damage control. They might hurt their reputation or image at the start and a little bit here and then. We know how fast the internet moves. This stuff does get forgotten. I mean, think about it. Kotaku have been a joke for years at this point. So many people say they stop reading them. So many people swear off them and they just insult this, that and the other. Kotaku's a joke, but... But they're clearly still here. The numbers are still keeping them going. There's, you, you can't deny it. Like I said, from what I've been told about it as well, is that they secretly love it. What they usually do is they usually look at it and say, okay, the positives outweigh the negatives. We're still winning long term with this. You can't, I mean, whoever's in charge of Kotaku clearly knows that journalistic integrity be damned. Because that's not what it runs on these days. They have to hit deadlines, they have to hit numbers, they have to hit targets. That's all they give a shit about nowadays. And, I mean, it clearly reflects that. It's clearly true. <sighs> An absolute mess. Anyway, don't worry, guys. We're coming up to the end. We've got maybe about five more minutes left. There's not much to go here. So, next up is Konami. Now, we all know Konami an announced three, t three different collections recently. Three different titles with different collections. They have the arcade title, the arcade collection. 
the Contra collection and the Castlevania collection. Now, by the time you're seeing this video, the arcade collection is already out. Each collection contains eight games. They're going to be sold digital only for $20, 20 euro, or I think it's 16 pounds. And each of them contains eight games with a couple of extra modern amenities and niceties, stuff like that. Now, when the Contra one and the Castlevania one were both announced, they were announced with only four games. Now, they said there will be eight games, but they only listed four each. And they said we will announce the other four at a later date. Konami has come out and announced because it's coming first. Uh, well, because the Contra one and the Castlevania one are still to re due to release. They've announced that the Castlevania one is coming first. It's going to release on May 16th. Same price as well. Digital only, blah, blah, blah. 20 euro, blah, blah, blah. And they've announced all eight games that are going to be in it. So, the eight games are as follows. Castlevania, Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse, Castlevania 2, Belmont's Revenge, Super Castlevania 4, Castlevania Bloodlines, Kid Dracula, Castlevania The Adventure, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. And, yeah, you have eight games there as well. Now, this is a decent list. I mean, for, for 20 euro, just the fact to have Castlevania, like, Castlevania 1, 2, and 3, original Castlevania 1, 2, and 3, they, they're not a huge draw to me personally, but I know a lot of people out there to have the NES trilogy that they grew up with on like a modern platform or something. Many of them would pay for just that alone. You've also got Cast Super Castlevania 4, which is fantastic. You've got Bloodlines, which is fantastic. So the, the fact that Castlevania 4 and Bloodlines are both expensive games, if you want to play them yourself elsewhere, that's important. And that works really well in this regard. And to an extent... The, the fact that Kid Dracula this is going to be the first release outside Japan ever, officially, that's a good one too. It, it helps bring a game outside the, the Eastern market for the first time. Something that I'm hoping other companies have kind of followed suit with. Nintendo did it once with, with Mother 1, which is Earthbound Begins. And I'm hoping that, that Square Enix, I was going to say Nintendo, <laughs> hopefully Square Enix will do it at some point with Secret of Mana 2. Hopefully they translate the SNES version and bring that over, not do a shitty 3D remake like they did with Secret of Mana. Anyway, I do think it's kind of interesting that there's no Symphony of the Night, Rondo of Blood, and or Dracula X. I'm kind of not surprised because of the PS4 collection. There was probably something, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure Sony probably said, oh, you know, give us exclusive rights to publish this anywhere for a year, or whatever it is. So I'm kind of not surprised that they didn't put Symphony of the Night in. Well, one thing I have seen a lot of though is you see a lot of switch fanboys that were salty about that they were convinced that oh we don't need that ps4 collection this uh this eight game collection is going to have symphony of the night and rondo in it anyway or at least symphony of the night and dracula x but now it's got neither boom get wrecked anyway we've talked about the release date we've talked about the the price as well 20 euro may 16th that's coming soon now Last topic before we round out the end of the video. We have Assassin's Creed Unity. We all know that unfortunately at some point during this week there was the massive fire in Paris and uh, Notre Dame Cathedral has been, yeah, it's been fairly significantly damaged. Now, there are a lot of people out there uh, obviously who are very upset about this. It's a very big cultural landmark. It's a big piece of history. And some billionaires have chipped in and they've said, okay, you know, let's give 600 million just to... Just like that, just to, to help restore it and to help bring it back. They're doing all types of stuff to to bring it back. They're doing they're using different source material that was based on the original one. They're uh, Assassin's Creed Unity to an extent. Uh, from what I understand, um, Notre Dame was like properly recreated in there. And you've got there's there's architects with laser scans and it's so they can recreate it as faithfully as possible, maybe change one or two things to kind of update it a little bit. But the point is that Ubisoft are are donating five hundred thousand euro for the the restoration project, which is good. I I don't like Ubisoft, but fair balls, I'll give them that. There's that's doing good. And at the same time, they gave away Assassin's Creed Unity. They gave away Assassin's Creed Unity for free for roughly a week on Uplay. Now, you can go and add it on Uplay for free. I, I even added it, to be honest, but I have no interest in ever playing it, but I've added it. That's the main thing. I mean, <laughs> it's a free game. It's just click, and that's it. I mean, I, I went for probably months, if not years, without even bothering to boot the Xbox app on my PC to download my, or to even add them to my library of the, the free games on Xbox One. But I did it for this one anyway. Just I don't know why. It just it was easier. I don't know. 
But like I said, they gave the way a game they gave away the game for free. But it doesn't stop there. So many people downloaded and played the game for free that when they tried to do the online sessions, the online co-op sessions and matchmaking and whatnot, the servers couldn't handle it. There were so many people that wanted to play it just because it was free that the servers could not handle it. And Ubisoft had to take the servers down to expand the server capacity. I just think that's so funny in a game that was kind of panned and flopped several years ago. What was it, 2014? In a game that panned and flopped five years ago. They give it away for free and suddenly there's too much demand for for the servers. Now, I don't know if it's a good game. All I know is that they push the technology too far than what the consoles could be capable of. Who knows, maybe they'll remaster it for PS5 and Xbox 2.4. You heard it here first, guys. And maybe it'll run properly because fundamental design choices will be significantly further because of Navi architecture and because of Ryzen architecture. But anyway, that's beside the point. Back to the whole server issue thing. So I think that that's funny as well. And not only that, it goes one step further. Not only did they have to take the servers down because the, the sheer demand was so large that they couldn't handle it and had to increase the capacity. There's a form of review bombing going on with Assassin's Creed Unity. Now, when you think, when you think review bombing, okay, you think along the likes of the Borderlands review bombing. Borderlands 1, Borderlands 2, and Borderlands the pre-sequel had their review scores completely bombed on Steam because of Borderlands 3 coming to the Epic Game Store. So that's the process where a shitload of people would go and leave negative reviews and say, oh, you know, I put a thousand hours into this, a thousand hours into that, and now take two or 2K games, Randy Pitchford, Gearbox are screwing me over because they're going to the Epic Game Store. Now, Steam removes all these now anyway, but that's beside the point. But that's the act of review bombing. However, with Assassin's Creed Unity, <laughs> they did positive review bombs. So you got hundreds, if not thousands of people coming in and upvoting the game because of the depiction of Notre Dame in, in Assassin's Creed Unity and possibly because of what Ubisoft are doing for Assassin's Creed, or not for, uh, for restoring Notre Dame. I don't know. I just think it's very strange. It's, it's very wholesome, and it's something you would not expect from anything relating to Ubisoft. Who knows, it's 2019, this is a bizarre world anyway. But that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. We're going to round out the end of, of this one with our, with our usual little ending segment of what am I doing and what am I playing this week? Well... I have finished Final Fantasy VI, as you already know, I mentioned it before. I've started up my next major game, which is Yakuza 0. Played a little bit of it so far, I'm into Chapter 3, just at the very, very start. The game is so OTT and completely extra, and I fucking love it. It's so good so far. It's Some of the stuff, like Kiryu, he's just, it's so over the top. I, I, it's the, the reactions, the depictions of everything. It's just so over the top in a way that I love. But it still retains, it still does it with retaining that little bit of seriousness. Like it, it, you have all this story and uh, like all, all the characters and all this stuff, but then there's just this this element of absurdity and of ludicrousness in it, and it's done so well. I would arguably compare it to Borderlands. But obviously more serious. But at the same time, it can have that kind of absurdity, that kind of humor, that kind of quirkiness, all at the same time. And it could just manage it. And it works really well. The combat's really good. The game looks great. It runs like a dream on PC. It's it's really good stuff. From what I understand, I'm going to I'm mostly gonna play through Yakuza Zero. I'm gonna move on to Yakuza Kiwami. From what I understand, that's a much better game and a much better engine and a much better everything because of it being a proper remake and uh, they've kind of improved it more. A lot of the stuff in it is supposedly better. And of course, I'm going to move on to Yakuza Kiwami 2, which is the one with the new engine, the, the proper engine, the Dragon engine, I think it's called, which is the one that Yakuza 6 
Yakuza the final Yakuza game and Yakuza Kiwami 2 they used a modern engine so I, that's going to look even better because some of the stuff in Yakuza 0 on PC looks fantastic it looks really good it plays really well it looks great at 120 fps but it's it's so good I can't wait to see what happens Kiryu's my boy I've just unlocked I've just began the chapter where you first get control of Goro Mijima and from his intro don't really like him too much but We'll see how it goes from beyond there. Kiryu at all, and some of the stuff with him, that's a whole other story. That's rad. You guys know. You guys know. But other than that, what else have I got here? I'm still slowly working my way through Batman the Animated Series. So many episodes, so I, I have kind of chilled out and pulled back on it a little bit. I don't watch it as much because between playing stuff like uh, Borderlands 2... Uh, that Well, that's on my list next. Between playing Borderlands 2 and between playing Yakuza 0, doing some real life stuff and all that as well. And it's uh, I have to find a time to watch maybe one episode here or there instead of maybe watching three or four a night you know, or three or four a day or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But it's still good. I'm working through it. I still love it as always. Uh, other than that, I stopped watching the AVGN part because, you know, I said I was working my way through that. I, I might watch one episode a week or one episode every few days now. Maybe if I'm, I don't know, if I'm waiting on... It's like, oh, look, I've got eight minutes to kill. What do I watch? You know, that kind of that kind of stuff. It's not that I don't enjoy it or anything. It's just my time at the moment is fairly limited and fairly precious. Despite being on holidays from work for two weeks, I have a lot I want to get done. Uh, da, da, da. That's basically it. Oh, yeah, I'm playing a lot of Borderlands 2. We've got a co-op game going on. It's so, it's so good. Between the gameplay... The humor and comedy of Borderlands 2, the people I'm playing with, they just, it's its so good. We have our own little back and forth go, going on in it. It's its really good. I mean, obviously, as as a zero main, you know, I'm, I'm obviously cold as ice. I've got the quips, I've got the haikus, I've got the everything. Be it zero in-game with the haikus or me with the quip, you know, it's, you got to do what you got to do. You, people say, you get in character? Well, you know, I don't play game. Game plays me. That's all it is. That's all it is. And other than that, I'll touch on a f the final one real quick just before we end. Is uh, I got a Kindle, uh, and I've been kind of working on that. I want to use it for books and stuff. So I, I tested it out real quick with comics and graphic novels. It's not great for them. Obviously, the main purchase reason of it was books because I want to read more. There's, there's, there's nothing like a real book. I've got a lot of physical books, but I want to actually use it, if you will. Hopefully, I do. We'll see how it goes. I want to read some good sci-fi. Have some of them on there. Uh, I'm going on a trip fairly soon. The next few... Actually, I'm, I should probably say that here now too. I'm going on... Uh, I'm going on a trip in a few days. From uh, this Wednesday to this Saturday. And... I, obviously, there'll be no content and all. It'll be fairly light in the meantime. I might make one or two in the meantime that I can... Have set the schedule to go live while I'm gone. But I can use the Kindle during those trips between like train journeys, bus journeys, flights. I can use the candle for all that stuff, so that'll be good. Anyway, that's it. That is the end of episode four. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the fourth episode of our lovely little quack experimental podcast. Don't worry, guys, the name will be explained at some point in the future. If you don't understand it, who knows when that will be. Maybe tomorrow? Maybe next week, maybe a year from now. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. As always, I want to thank everyone for watching, for joining me in any way, shape, or form. Let me know if you want anything that you feel I should maybe have a possibility of being interested in, want to talk about whatever it is. Feel free to either leave a comment in one of these ones down below or hit up the, the Twitter machine. You can slide into my DMs on there. They are open and I'll check out whatever it is. Might even talk about it because, well, you know, why not? It could pique my interest. As always, I want to thank everyone, like I said, for, for watching. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, the like button, the dislike button, whatever. The little notification bell, why not? And remember, before we are out of here, I want to take a quick second to do a little public service announcement that is very, very important. Because if you did not know, I want to remind you that winners... Don't play switch ports.